Um, welcome to our Neurodiversity Scholar Series with Zosha Zaks. Today, I've asked uh, Zosha Zaks to answer a question. Uh, what are some important accommodations for neurodivergent college students? My name is uh, John Woodruff. I'm the Director of Accessibility Services at um, Rhone University. Um, Welcome, Zosha. It would be uh, terrific if you could uh, begin by sharing a little bit about yourself and then jump right into our question. What are some important accommodations for neurodivergent college students? Okay, thank you, John. Uh, so a little bit more about me. I am an autistic adult. I was diagnosed in adulthood. My professional training is as a rehabilitation counselor, and I have worked with neurodivergent teenagers and young adults for about 20 years. And I also teach disability studies courses. So both as a professor and a student, I can speak to how important accommodations have been um, both in my classrooms, but also from the student perspective in me, you know, achieving, um, you know, edu educational goals. Um, so um, I appreciate an opportunity to speak about this topic um, because I think it's, it's so important. So what are accommodations? That's, that's a basic question to start with. Uh, accommodations fall under the social model approach to disability. And the idea of accommodations is that they, they can provide for a disabled person um, support or you know, um, structural changes or different kinds of, of um, accommodations so that they can participate equally in their activities at school, at work, and in the community. Um, Colleges do have to provide accommodations under the 1973 Rehabilitation Act. Um, again, the idea is that accommodations allow um, students to, you know, stu disabled students to have the same opportunities to participate in classes, join student life activities, earn their degree, reach their potential, do all the same things that other college students are doing. Um, I divided types of accommodations into four sections, just by way of trying to organize the information. Of course, there's some overlap with all of these categories, but to, to kind of give a structure to our, to our conversation. Um, so the different types of accommodations that, we're, that I'm gonna talk about today, one I lump under traditional accommodations, another is universal design for learning. I'm gonna talk a little bit about autism and neurodiversity specific accommodations that um, don't always fall under traditional. Sometimes they do. Again, like I said, there's some overlap. Um, I'm also going to talk about what I call social accommodations. So the traditional accommodations, this is what's required by the federal guidelines and policies, and the need is documented. Uh, Rowan has the Office of Accessibility Services, and that office manages accommodations. These are the, the you know, common, the kind of accommodations people typically think about when we're talking about accommodations. For example, extended time on tests, note takers, maybe a student needs materials in braille or they need ASL interpretation. Um, so if you need to find out more, um, you can contact the Office of Accessibility Services. And as we have John here today, you can also contact John um, Woodruff, who's the director at Woodruff at Rowan.edu. There's also a QR code here that you can scan. Um, so UDL, Universal Design for Learning, is not really an accommodation per se, but it winds up being a very accommodating practice. The idea of UDL is um, that it's a it's a set, uh, it's a, it's a way of designing a course so that all learners can participate. Um, and UDL focuses on alternative ways to engage with knowledge, alternative ways to represent knowledge, and alternative ways to express what you know. And like I said, UDL helps all students because it allows students to sort of build off their strengths in reaching learning objectives. But I think UDL in particular can help um, disabled students because uh, when a classroom is using LD UDL, um, there's just that many more options for participating and expressing and being assessed. So here's a few examples. 
you know, um, you may have students draw their reactions to political events. That could be great for a student who's more artistic in nature and, and finds it easier to express themselves visually. Um, different ways to learn. You could have students act out as Shakespeare scenes instead of just reading it. That, that might be great for, you know, um, students who are more kinetic and move around a lot. Um, different ways to assess. Okay, so you may um, require a written essay at the end, but if you're also willing to grade students um, who submit a video, that could be great for students with dyslexia or other conditions who, you know, may find writing an essay difficult, but have amazing things to say. You can find out more information about UDL on the CAST website. CAST is an organization that um, has a lot of information on their website, as well as materials and workshops on, on UDL. So this section, I'm gonna talk a little bit about accommodations um, that are specific to neurodiversity. Um, but just at the outset, I wanna put out there, it can also help students with, with other conditions too. And in order to sort of explain the value of the um, accommodations that I'm, I'm gonna cover, um, I did wanna sort of give some examples of, of, of challenges that come up. So for example, sensory. Sensory, the sensory environment of a classroom can be very challenging for some neurodiverse um, people. For example, there's smells, noise, lights, they may need depressure to concentrate um, routines. So many neurodivergent people will only sit in a specific seat where they may only use a certain kind of pen or they come in, they sit down, they turn on their laptop, even if they're never gonna use it. Um, spatial, they may need to be away from other people or they may need to sit near a window or they may need to sit in the front. Um, movement, some neurodivergent People need to pace or stretch or they, they'll stim, which means they have some motor motions. Uh, communication is also sometimes um, a challenge. So they may talk and, and you know, use verbal language, but under pressure, it may be very hard for them to answer a question or they may have difficulty um, you know, sharing what they know in front of other people verbally. Um, so, uh, this was just a little video montage, and, and you can see visually just how overstimulating, you know, a lecture hall or an average classroom can be with all the different lights and sounds and smells and, and you know, the, the color of the walls and the, how crowded it can be. Uh, so some accommodations that can be very helpful, um, sensory safe classroom policies. Uh, I always give an example how I taught a class and it was right at five o'clock when people were getting hungry in the evening and some people wanted to eat or needed to eat and but other people that would pose a sensory challenge so I had a, 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 a sort of compromise where people who um, needed to eat could go on one side of the classroom and those who were very distracted by the rustling of potato chip bags and the smell of food could go on the other side it wasn't perfect but it helped a little bit allowing sensory tools for example earplugs or sunglasses and this is where this can come up for other conditions, not just neurodiverse conditions. So someone may need to wear sunglasses for medical reasons, for example. Um, giving students permission to stand or move a little bit as long as it's not totally distracting or blocking the views of other people. Ignoring behaviors that don't impact learning, that is really kind of an accommodation. You know, it's sort of falls under attitudinal accommodations where we accept that there's just different kinds of people. And if it doesn't impact the learning, and what's going on in your classroom, you can just ignore, for example, you know, somebody who, you know, maybe they flap their hands when they're excited or they pace in the back periodically um, to keep themselves regulated and engaged. Um, allowing seat choice, uh, allowing alternatives to answering questions or speaking in front of people. And the last one I think is also really important, which is to presume that people are engaged unless you really have data to the contrary. So just because someone's wearing sunglasses or someone has to look down, um, that doesn't mean they're not participating in learning. That's just what they need to do. Um, so that's a very a, important accommodation too. Um, the last kind of category of accommodations um, is what I call social accommodations. And sometimes people are surprised that I say that. The classroom is a very social place. You're engaging with other people. 
you're dialoguing, sharing, you, you know, there's different roles. There's the role of the teacher, the role of the students, the role of, you know, guest speaker. You're working together in groups often to solve problems and you have to handle your frustration and other emotions that come up. So it's a very social place. Um, so when I say, you know, provide social accommodations, you know, some people say, might say, well, why? What's, what, what's the reasoning behind that? Neurodivergent students may not always know the reasons why um, certain things are required, or they may not know the social rules or the expectations for your classroom. Um, and we tend to do better when those expectations and the different options are, are very clear. I want to emphasize that, 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 you know, needing social accommodations um, is not meant to stigmatize neurodivergent people. Um, it's not that we wholesale lack social skills. Rather, you know, our society really um, favors indirect communication. Um, social expectations are rarely relayed very explicitly. So it can be hard to read what those expectations and rules are. And um, this is where you know, there is that overlap you know, it's, it's true that it can be hard for students from other cultures too. So this is why we always say, you know, accommodations may start out as designed for a certain group, but it really does wind up helping everybody. So what I mean by social accommodations, things like, you know, being very clear what the schedule for the day is, you know, bringing those guidelines um, and expectations for, for behavior, for engagement to the surface. Um, directly stating why you're having students do something, time estimates, being clear on different roles. So for example, you know, guest speaker is coming and, and they're going to be speaking the whole time and it's a special trip. And so we give them all the airtime. Um, you know, another big thing that comes up for um, individuals, uh, you know, with neuro, neuro, neurodiversities is um, it can be very hard if a teacher says, okay, everybody go put yourself selves into groups or find a partner to work with. Uh, so it can often be much better for the teacher to just assign groups to different projects because that can be very hard for someone to initiate. Um, scaffolding for discussions and sharing. So if you can do it, you know, one-on-one -on -one first, then it might be easier to do it in a small group. And then it might be um, something that you could move to do in front of the whole class. So providing those opportunities to, to, to build up to um, you know, a whole class uh, project or, or um, sharing. Um, facilitating peer integration. What I mean by that is that sometimes it can be hard for neurodivergent students to get into the flow of, of the life of your classroom. So if students are breaking into groups, for example, to study with each other, okay, uh, a neurodivergent person might not necessarily be able to navigate that without a little facilitation. Um, I also think that knowing what to do if you need more time or more help, and you may say, well, doesn't everybody know that? But again, it goes back to that explicit um, communication idea that, that for some of us, that explicit information is really, really valuable and very helpful. Um, and also because every classroom is different. So you may say, well, they go to classes all the time, so don't they know this, but your classroom is different than you know, another teacher's classroom. Uh, some examples of explicit classroom expectations, just saying today during the 70 minutes, I'm going to lecture for 30, then we're going to do a project for 20, and then I'll take questions for 20 minutes. So please save your questions for the question period. Uh, you know, you might say something like during group discussions, uh, we want everyone to share, so keep your comments to two minutes. Uh, you know, if you're doing a lab, you know, there's some expectations around being quiet. So if you're frustrated, that's okay, but don't shout, go out in the hall, take a few minutes to compose yourself. Just letting people know these, these parameters and, and, and what the expectations are. Um, another one that comes up frequently is, you know, student may be asking dozens of questions or talking a lot. And so the teacher can't get their information out. So it's okay to say something like, you know, I really want students to feel free to ask me questions. So if you have two or three questions, that's a good guideline. If you, if you have more than three questions, come to me in, during office hours so I can get through my whole lecture today. Uh, a good tip when thinking about this social accommodation idea 
don't assume everyone uses the same social dictionary. That's how I put it. So when something's coming up in the classroom, oftentimes that's an opportunity to think about what's going on differently and see if maybe some, some of those explicit guidelines and information and, and parameters could, could really help the situation. In summary, creating uh, an accommodating classroom goes way beyond just the traditional accommodations we typically think about. Um, and it's a matter of social justice to ensure that everybody can learn in your classroom. As Socia, thank you uh, very much for this wonderful uh, presentation and the uh, thoughtful con uh, uh, content. I did have a couple questions I want to ask you. Um, I know that the pandemic um, uh, totally up ended the classroom. Um, uh, the traditional classroom setting, how the delivery of course material. Um, what like lessons do you think were learned with the pandemic with giving uh, professors, teachers uh, the opportunity to step outside their comfort zone and embrace UDL, even though they didn't know that they were at the time? Um, well, that's a loaded right. question. But. <laughs> Uh, well, it's a very excellent question. And you know, oftentimes something very challenging like a pandemic can lead to innovation. And I think that we, what we've learned is that it really is about maximizing options. You know, we're never gonna be able to provide every single possible permutation and option, but providing as many as we can, because some learners do much better in person. Other learners may do better having the option to be online sometimes if, you know, they aren't feeling well or they're overwhelmed that day, they can still listen, you know. So, um, you know, just that's the core of that UDL idea is just the more options we can put in there, the better people will, will, will do. And that's true on the um, professor side too, right? Because we may love teaching in line, but uh, I mean, teaching in person, sorry, we may love teaching in person, but there may be a day where, you know, getting there in person is hard, or we want a guest speaker from um, you know, all the way across the globe. And so then Zoom becomes very valuable. Yeah, I'm uh, reminded of uh, one professor's story uh, uh, where due to the pandemic, they were able to still have their class when they were away at a, a conference with this uh, virtual option that we didn't know about or utilize before the pandemic. Uh, one follow-up question regarding um, the first one is, um, so if a professor wants to embrace UDL and, and change things up, I know that they um, uh, uh, might be overwhelmed. <laughs> And I know that it's like recommended that they should start small. Like maybe you could also address the fact that, that they probably have um, other faculty that have experience with it that they can uh, 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 look to as a resource, a Nora diversity ally on campus so that they're not um, starting down this road thinking that they have to do everything at one time. Oh, no, definitely. You can just take, you know, I call it baby steps. You know, maybe you want to try with one assignment and say, you know, this is a really, you know, it's assignment that focuses very heavily on writing and it's very writing intense. What about a student who maybe doesn't shine so well with writing? Could I allow them to videotape themselves and just experiment with that a little bit? Um, and like you mentioned, you know, leaning into colleagues, I think that that's a great um, tip you know, see what other faculty are doing or what your department is doing or what resources your department might have. But another tip um, is also to talk to students and find out from students. Because if you're open-minded to that, I mean, I know it can be, you know, um, uh, sort of a, a challenging process at times, but I've had neurodivergent students come to me and say, hey, you know, that assignment would have been really much easier if, and it started me to think, hey, yeah, could I 
design that assignment a little differently or could I give some students that option in the future? So it's okay to get some feedback from students too and see how they might, um, you know, what suggestions they might have for things to, you know, go easier or to have those, those additional options going forward. Uh, that's great. Thank you. And uh, thanks again for uh, working with us to uh, create a series of uh, video briefs around neurodiversity. Uh, the other video briefs with Zosha are available on our Rhone University Center for Neurodiversity YouTube channel or website. Uh, thank you again. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.